Hello, I'm Anna Barch, coordinator of the Northeast Wisconsin Stormwater Consortium, a subsidiary of the Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance. NUSC is a collaborative of communities working together and sharing resources to effectively address stormwater issues and cause behavioral changes that improve the health of the waters of the Fox Wolf River Basin. NUSC is working to protect local waters from illicit discharge through public education and the creation of resources for municipal staff. The Wisconsin Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Program defines illicit discharge as any discharge to a municipal separate storm sewer system that is not composed entirely of stormwater. While some storm sewers are connected to stormwater ponds, many provide a direct route for pollutants to enter waters of the state without any filtration or treatment. It is important to catch illicit discharges before they become too severe. The frequency of illicit discharges can vary from a single event, like a direct dumping or an industrial spill, to continuous discharges, such as an illegal connection to a storm sewer system. Common types of illicit discharge include garbage, vehicle fluids, construction site runoff, and sewage failures. We often say only rain down the drain, but there are some exceptions to illicit discharge regulations. Some notable exemptions include firefighting activity, lawn watering, and individual residential car washing. However, some exceptions can be considered illicit discharge if considered to be a significant source of pollution. It is important to know what to look for when determining if an illicit discharge is taking place. Physical indicators of an illicit discharge include odor, color, turbidity, stains, floatables, vegetation, benthic growth, and gross solids. Chemical indicators taken from flow samples include chlorine, copper, detergent, phenol, and pH. Identified or suspected illicit discharge should always be reported quickly to better the chance of discovering the source. The member communities of NUSC work together with the DNR and with their citizens to reduce stormwater contamination. As an MS4 inspector looking for illicit discharge, your work will directly help keep our waters safe from this type of pollution. In this video, you will observe inspections at several different types of stormwater outfalls. The intention of this training is to familiarize MS4 inspectors with some different types of outfalls, as well as the data collection and sampling procedures used during field screenings. Upon arriving at the outfall, attempt to park as close to the outfall as possible. On-street parking may need traffic control such as warning signs, traffic cones, and hazard lights on the vehicle. If inspecting a manhole in a road, position the vehicle in a location that offers protection from traffic. Park the vehicle a sufficient distance away from the manhole to allow room in case of an impact. The required equipment will vary by outfall and can be customized for specific outfalls as experienced as gained. A backpack is useful for carrying extra gear to the outfall. For safety, always wear a safety vest or shirt and other PPE as needed, including safety glasses, steel toe boots, long pants, and hard hats in construction zones. Some outfalls require access from the water and may require rubber boots or waders. Work gloves or leather gloves can provide protection while climbing through brush to get to the outfall. Thick brush may require additional tools like a machete or hand snips. Almost all screening will require a tape measure, flashlight, bottles, and gloves for sample collection, a camera, and a method for recording inspection data such as a clipboard or tablet. Locating the outfall in the field can be one of the more difficult tasks in the screening process. If the MS4 map is accurate, the inspector may be able to use GPS to navigate to the outfall. Walk carefully in brush and tall grass, since hazards like holes and down branches can be hidden. Use caution when crossing riprap near outfalls, since individual rocks may be loose or slippery. Once the outfall is found, 
The location should be recorded with GPS to make future screenings easier. Once at the outfall, take the photos that are required for the inspection. This way, screening activities won't cause additional disturbances to be shown in the photos, like footprints or splashes. We typically take two photos for all outfall inspections. The first is a zoomed out general photo, which shows the location and general configuration of the outfall. The second is a more zoomed in flow photo, showing the inside of the pipe, the presence or absence of flow, and any physical indicators like stains or benthic growth. After the photos are taken, a visual inspection of the pipe is conducted using a flashlight if necessary. Any evidence of current or past illicit discharges is documented. Looking inside this pipe, even though the end of the pipe contained water, the pipe is dry a few feet from the end. In this case, we would document that there was no flow in the outfall at the time of the inspection. No sample would typically be collected since the water at the end of the pipe is the water from the pond, not storm water. If maintenance issues are observed around the outfall, like damage, deposition, erosion, or graffiti, additional photos will be taken to document those conditions. This next example will show the screening of a dry pipe. In this case, the pipe discharges through a concrete wall to a concrete channel and is most easily screened from the water. Past experience has shown that rubber boots are needed for this outfall. Walk carefully since submerged concrete channels can be slippery. Upon reaching the outfall, the outfall and flow photos are taken. The pipe shape, material, and size from the MS4 map are confirmed in the field. A visual inspection of the outfall pipe is conducted, looking for indicators like stains, discoloration, and benthic growth. Residue from suspended sediment is typically not considered an illicit discharge indicator unless it is excessive. Because there is no flow from the pipe, no sample is collected. The information collected during the inspection can be recorded on paper or on an electronic device. We typically use a tablet for data collection because it offers several advantages. First, the built-in GPS and MS4 mapping makes it easier to locate the outfall and perform upstream tracking if necessary. Second, the data entry forms have built-in validation to make sure that all of the necessary inspection information is recorded and valid. Finally, the data that is entered in the field automatically populates the reporting database, which saves data entry time and reduces transcription errors. This example will show how to collect a sample from a flowing outfall pipe. As with the other outfalls, we start with the outfall and flow photos first, so we won't have wet footprints from the inspection in the photos. Especially with flowing outfalls, a short 5 second video can be useful to document the intensity of the flow. We typically start the video with the inside of the pipe and slowly follow the flow down to the receiving water. Because we typically use subjective terms like trickle, moderate, and substantial to document flow intensity, the video helps document the observed flow. The size, shape, and material information from the MS4 map are confirmed, and then the visual inspection is started. In this case, the minor flow line stains and moderate green benthic growth on the pipe and apron would be documented. A flow sample is then collected in a clean 500 milliliter plastic bottle. Because of the moderate flow at this outfall, it is fairly easy to fill the sample bottle. Once the bottle is filled, any colors, odors, opacity, sheens, or bubbles are noted. This information, along with the visual observations, is recorded on the data entry form. The sample will be analyzed for the chemical parameters included in the municipality's ongoing screening program. In this example, two outfall pipes are discharging to the stream inside a culvert. The outfalls can be screened from the inside of the culvert if it is safe to enter. Use caution as the pipes may be slippery due to water, sediment, algae or benthic growth, or there may be hidden rocks. If it is not safe to enter the culvert, observe as much as possible from the end of the culvert and conduct the rest of the screening at the first upstream manhole. This first outfall pipe has a trickle flow, so a flow sample would be collected. The flow line down the side of the culvert should also be checked for stains or other indicators of illicit discharges. Music 
The second outfall pipe has no flow during this inspection. However, there are stains inside the end of the pipe which may indicate a previous illicit discharge. These stains would need to be noted on the data entry form and outfall report. However, there may be non-illicit reasons for the stains, including improper slope at the end of the pipe, which causes normal storm water to be trapped until it evaporates. This outfall may be flagged for future observation or maintenance. Detention basins typically discharge to a stream through a single outlet pipe. This outlet pipe is the outfall, since the MS-4 discharges to the water of the state at this location. This particular pond outlet has a backflow preventer, which prevents the stream water from backflowing into the detention basin during periods of high stream flow. The backflow preventer makes it slightly more difficult to observe conditions inside the pipe. Pond outfalls are inspected in the same way as other outfalls. The outfall and flow photos are taken, the size, shape, and materials are confirmed, a visual observation is conducted, and a sample is collected from the flow. In cases where moderate or substantial flows drop into a receiving body of water, it is common to see suds. While the suds may be caused by detergent, which is an illicit discharge, there are also many natural causes of suds. The sample will be tested for detergent to help distinguish between the two. Because detention basins are designed to fill during rainfall events and slowly release the storm water over a period of days, it is not uncommon to see a discharge from a pond even after waiting the typical 72 hours after a rainfall event. The next example shows a submerged outfall. An outfall is considered submerged if the invert of the outfall is below the level of the receiving water. In most cases, it will be considered partially submerged unless the entire pipe is below the receiving water, in which case it is fully submerged. Submerged outfalls pose a problem with sampling. Because the receiving water may be backing up into the outfall pipe, it may be difficult to determine if a sample collected from the end of the pipe is actually stormwater from the pipe or simply backed up stream water. If there is not obvious flow from the pipe, the outfall is typically screened at the first upstream manhole. This approach helps minimize the impact of the receiving water. If a stormwater flow or pool is observed in the upstream manhole, a sample can be collected from that location. If the upstream manhole is dry, that can be used as evidence of no flow at the outfall. When possible, submerged outfalls follow the same inspection procedure as non-submerged outfalls. Photos are taken, measurements are confirmed, and a visual inspection is conducted at the end of the pipe. The depth of the water in the pipe is also recorded. One trick with submerged outfalls is to drop some leaves or grass into the submerged pool to look for flow. If flow is observed, it would be safe to collect a sample from the pipe since it should be the storm sewer flow. Otherwise, collect from the upstream manhole. At this outfall, the moderate green benthic growth on the side of the pipe and apron would be noted on the outfall report. For outfalls that are submerged, inaccessible, or not located, a screening is typically conducted at the first upstream manhole. Storm sewer manholes are typically located in the street, but in some cases, like this one, the manhole may be located closer to the outfall. Open the manhole using a manhole pick, pickaxe, or other appropriate tool. Lids are heavy, so use appropriate lifting techniques. Because manholes can be confined spaces, they should not be entered for screening. All screening activities can be completed from the surface. A flashlight may be needed to see to the bottom of the manhole. The visual observation looks for similar conditions as pipe screening. Any stains, sheens, suds, benthic growth, growth solids, or other signs of pot potential illicit discharge should be noted. 
Similar to pipe outfalls, the photos are taken prior to sampling so that the undisturbed manhole and flow line can be documented. The photos sometimes reveal details that are not readily visible from the surface, and the camera can be used to get a complete view of the manhole from different angles. In cases where a submerged pool is observed in a manhole, the depth of the pool is measured and recorded. To collect a sample, a telescoping sampling pole is used to collect a sample and transfer it to the sample bottle. This eliminates the need to enter the manhole. For low flows or shallow pools, several dips may be necessary to fill the 500 milliliter sample bottle. Make sure the sampling container is decontaminated between manholes. When the screening is finished, make sure the manhole cover is replaced securely. If there are stones or sediment on the rim, clean the rim off before replacing the cover. A clean rim helps eliminate rocking and banging when cars drive over the manhole. Another common type of outfall, especially in rural areas, is the swale outfall. Swales are typically grass, but they can also be concrete, asphalt, riprap, or other materials. The most common scenario for swale outfalls is a road crossing a stream. In this case, the four swales drain toward the low point in the road, which is at the stream crossing. There will be an outfall located in each place where the swale discharges to the stream. During the field inspection, follow the swale to the point where it meets the stream. This will be your outfall location. Take your outfall and flow photos at this location to document any presence or absence of flow. Make a note of any potential indicators of illicit discharge. This will usually be dead vegetation for grass swales or stains or other signs for concrete or asphalt channels. The other common scenario for swales is when a swale crosses a municipal boundary, such as flowing from a town into a city. In this case, an outfall will be located right at the municipal boundary and should be screened at that location. Another application of this principle is when the swales from one road cross a road of a different jurisdiction, such as a county highway. In this case, the swales from the county road will have an outfall at the right-of-way of the county highway. In the field, identify the location of the right-of-way line using common objects like utility poles or right-of-way markers, or use GPS if it's available. Once the outfall location is identified, take the normal outfall and flow photos. If there is flow or standing water at the location, collect a sample for further analysis. Field testing of the samples that were collected at the outfalls usually takes place back at the truck. This eliminates the need to carry all of the testing equipment to the outfall and allows the test to be run in a more controlled environment. Most tests can easily be run on site. Ammonia, copper, and chlorine use test strips. Temperature, pH, and conductivity can be measured using a single probe. The tests for detergent and phenol are typically run back at the office since they use multiple reagents, some of which are hazardous, and the tests are not time sensitive. To test for chlorine, the chlorine test strip is placed in the sample for 30 seconds. A timer is used to ensure the proper timing. The copper test is similar but only takes 5 seconds. When the proper time has elapsed, the test strip is compared to the colors on the label to estimate the concentration. In this case, the lack of color indicates no chlorine was detected in the sample.
The ammonia test is also conducted with test strips, except the test strip includes a second reagent patch. A small amount of sample is poured into a vial that is provided with the test strips. The test strip is then agitated inside the vial for 30 seconds to mix the sample with the reagent and to react with the test strip. At the end of 30 seconds, the test strip is compared to the key on the bottle. The strip changes from yellow to green with increasing concentrations of ammonia. In this case, the solid yellow color indicates no ammonia. A single probe can be used to measure temperature, pH, and conductivity. The probe tip is kept wet between samples with tap water. To conduct the testing, the tap water is removed from the test cup, a small amount of sample is placed in the cup, and the probe is placed into the sample. The display will show the pH and temperature of the sample and can be toggled to show conductivity. The test results are recorded on the sample log sheet along with the other results. These numbers will be entered into the database after the detergent and phenol tests are run in the office. The standard panel of analytical tests includes pH, copper, chlorine, phenol, and detergent. Alternate parameters can be used if approved by the DNR. We typically use a modified panel consisting of pH, temperature, conductivity, chlorine, ammonia, and detergent. We have found that this panel is more effective at identifying and tracking potential elicitous charges in this area. Upon completion of the screening each day, make sure all equipment is cleaned, dried, and returned to its storage location. Replenish any testing supplies or other disposable supplies that were used in the field. Repair any broken equipment and recharge any rechargeable equipment. Inspection equipment should be maintained and organized so it's ready for the next inspection or for emergency response.